literally false, metaphorically true. Again, and just you know, there's just a lot in this Have you chapter. Shown that book yet? I I, I did. It's it makes me very. I, I was doing it while you're working on the tech stuff. So, yeah. So we uh, actually it makes just me very very happy. we got it yesterday. Apparently they have sold enough of them in advance that the copies that we were supposed to end up with got sent to other people. So anyway, yeah. we have just seen it and we're kind of just, excited to just seen it. hold it in our hands. Very much so. So we're not going to read on conformity or religion and ritual or sex, drugs, and rock and roll on the sacred versus the shamanistic. We're saving that for those of you who actually get the book. But we are going to read literally false, metaphorically true. I am going to share that here. It's three pages. Cultural beliefs are often literally false, but metaphorically true. Consider farmers in Highland Guatemala who have a long-standing tradition to both plant and harvest crops only when the moon is full. This, they say, allows the plants to grow stronger and resist insect damage. What possible protective capacity could the phase of the moon have on crop health? Presumably none. But the phase of the moon can synchronize the farmers. A full moon is effectively a giant sky clock, a keeper of time that everyone in the region can see. If all farmers in the region believe that a full moon has salutary effects on their individual crops, they will likely restrict planting and harvesting to the full moon, and this will, in fact, benefit everyone's crops, just not for the reason the farmers believe. A belief in the power of the moon to directly affect crops effectively satiates predators by concentrating the harvest into brief periods, during which time crop predators cannot eat all of everyone's crops. It is easy to dismiss many myths and beliefs of old precisely because they are literally false. Indeed, doing, doing so is almost a sport among some hard-headed people. Take astrology. It is clearly beyond reason to imagine that the stars that we see, many of which are thousands of light years away, are having a direct impact on human behavior. Similarly, it is beyond reason to believe that a passel of angry gods is the reason for tsunamis. Yet among the Moken, those who believe in those gods survive at higher rates than those who don't. And it is surely beyond reason to believe that a full moon is protective of crop health, yet among Guatemalan farmers, precisely that belief results in more productive farming. In each case, the belief is literally false, but metaphorically true. This means that the cover story isn't true, but when people behave as if it were, they prosper. This is how religion and other belief structures spread. Even if such things are not literally true, acting as if they are benefits people. Sometimes it even benefits the biodiversity and sustainability of the land in which they live. In its modern tabloid form, astrology is bunk. But astrology has probably not been so everywhere and for all time. If, and this is a big if, you control for where a person was born, might not the time of year that they were born have effects on how they develop and therefore who they become? And aren't astrological signs just an ancient way of keeping track of the months, more or less? If we look at astrology this way, rather than as a modern indulgence that is too free of context and history to have meaning, it begins to look promising. Is a newborn in a Minnesota winter exposed to the same pathogens and activities as a newborn in a Minnesota summer? Surely not. And sure enough, there has been work done to bear out this idea. Culling, idea, culling data from over 1.75 million records at New York Presbyterian Columbia University Medical Center for people born between 1900 and 2000, researchers found clear correlations between birth month and lifetime disease risk for more than 55 different conditions. With affected systems ranging from cardiovascular to respiratory, from neurological to sensory, the sheer number and breadth of medical conditions that vary in lifetime risk by birth month should be enough to make a thoughtful person rethink a wholesale rejection of careful astrological thinking. For if there are demonstrable differences in disease risk by birth month, why should we imagine that there are no differences in personality? As an aside, one prediction of this approach to astrology is that if you include both birthplace and date, astrology will have less power to predict lifetime disease risk the closer you get to the equator, where seasonality is much reduced from that in the temperate zones. Another prediction is that the more a person moves around as a child, the less predictive astrology will be for them. And if you don't include birthplace, astrology should have no predictive power at all. Distortions that help you survive and thrive are adaptive. Myths and taboos often make little sense to outsiders, and some of them are surely misguided, even counterproductive for those who honor them. Some surprisingly precise taboos are likely overgeneralizations from an actual event. Among the Kamayura of the Brazilian Amazon, the eating of scaleless fish is forbidden for both pregnant women and their husbands. It may well be that long ago, a terrible fate befell a woman, her unborn child, or her entire family after eating a fish without scales, and that the fish was the only explanation that stuck. Similarly, on the oat plateau of Madagascar, in the village of Mahatsinjo, there is a taboo against eating hammercops, a close relative of pelicans. This taboo is directly tied to villagers having seen one fly over just as a man died. 
elsewhere in Madagascar, it is taboo for young men to eat mutton before wooing, taboo for pregnant women to eat the meat of hedgehogs or to walk through fields of pumpkin, taboo for a son to build his home to the north or east of his father's house. To our Western sensibilities, this seems like superstition, pure and simple. The word for taboo in Malagasy, fadi, has a complex meaning as well. In Batsamasarika, the language of the people of northeastern Madagascar, fadi means both taboo and sacred. That which is fadi is mandated by the ancestors, be it mandated that you don't do it or that you do. Despite the preceding examples, many beliefs, myths, and taboos are literally false metaphorically true. Malagasy fadis come cloaked in the language of gods and ancestors, but it is still easy to see the wisdom in many of them if you simply look at the prohibition. Do not build a house over or against a new landslide. Do not step on a dead dog as you might get hydrophobia, rabies. Do not divorce your wife while she is pregnant. Good advice. We predict that those taboos that have lasted the longest are most likely to be hiding an important cultural truth in plain sight. Beware Chesterton's fatties. The old ideas, I'm sorry. Beware Chesterton's fatties. The old ideas may have hidden truths and those truths may be difficult to recover once they have been dismissed. Joseph Campbell observed that mythology is a function of biology. He was correct. As an evolved creature, you are built to succeed, and sometimes that involves telling yourself stories. Finding yourself in a raft near the top of a dangerously tall waterfall, you might be about to die. If you believe that the shore is within reach and paddle like hell, you just might make it. Those deflated by long odds will leave no trace. Belief can be the difference between life and death. I believe you have old, uh, you have angered both the old gods and the new with that <laughs> I have, reading. Yes, I'm, I'm sure that will um, anger at least some proponents of both the old gods and the new. Um, but I mean, it, it, precisely because, as is true of everything in the book, we are trying to weave our way carefully um, down a road that understands the reality and importance of history and reveals a path forward, or at least the beginning of a path forward, that has uh, that has the potential to reveal great things, which we can't even yet imagine. Yep. I mean, in fact, you know, as we present this in the book, and as we have mentioned periodically here, this activity, whether it's writing the book and uh, having people read it and discuss it, or us talking about ideas from it and other things, is effectively a modern version of the campfire around which consciousness would have been practiced. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe we did not say up front that one of the implications of the model of consciousness and culture that we present is that it reverses the natural expectation about why consciousness emerged. So mm -hmm. while consciousness has been um, famously resistant to explanation, if you think of it primarily as, and we argue that it would initially have evolved as a mechanism for individuals to pool their cognitive strengths and come up with uh, an emergent sum that is greater than the, or an emergent whole that is greater than the sum of the parts, then individual consciousness, which we all take to be primary because we experience individual consciousness and intersubjective consciousness is something that we only have indirect access to. The idea that we may share a thought is not as vivid as any thought that either of us would have. It's much more powerful because there are two minds involved in creating it, but it is much less visceral. Mm -hmm. And so well, our argument is that we have studied consciousness incorrectly in science. And in fact, this is reinforced just by the practicality. You can put an individual into an fMRI machine. You cannot put a group of people into an fMRI machine and see what is shared in their cognition, at least not simply. One of the big drumbeats of the book, of course, is a rejection, a recognition of the value of the reductionism in modern science and medicine, and also a rejection of its ubiquity, of mistaking that which can be easily measured for that which is the most important thing in a system. Absolutely. And so in, in, in this case, it's not that we deny the existence and the importance of individual consciousness, but we argue that it is likely to have come second, that you build a model that allows people to pool their consciousness together. And then once you have the tool that involves knowing what is likely in someone else's mind, maybe because you placed it there, you now have a tool in which you can have an argument with yourself. You can hold two ideas and compare them as if you were two different minds comparing notes. Um, and in any case, uh, we regard this as likely a solution to many of the most difficult issues surrounding consciousness, just simply by getting the evolutionary order of operations correct. Mm -hmm.